Hi, and welcome to Automation Unpacked, Tales from the Warehouse, where we aim to support, guide, and inspire you on your path to automate your warehouse facilities. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by Steve Zimmerman, who is head of Global Alliances at Locus Robotics. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chloe. I'm really happy to be here. All right. Well, I would love to just start out by talking a little bit about Locus in general. I feel like you guys are everywhere. There's been some big announcements in the industry, I'd say, recently. Um, just I think it was in May, uh, the partnership with DHL was announced, which was, I think, the largest AMR deal to date in the industry. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chloe. And, and you're right. Um, DHL is a um, is one of our premier customers on a global basis, uh, probably our single largest user of our bots to date. And I think that, you know, the announcement that was made regarding um, their latest acquisition of uh, Locust bots to be deployed around the globe is really a testament to their team, their vision, their commitment to delivering value to their customers, and then leveraging our, our bots and our software technology to help them along that journey. Uh, you know, we've got a fairly longstanding relationship with DHL. We've learned a lot along the road uh, in various parts of the world as we've deployed. But again, I think it's really a tribute to their 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 strategy, their vision uh, in terms of being a market leader. And, uh, you know, we're thrilled to be working with them. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, and another, I think it was maybe even last week, the announcement around your new global headquarters up in Wilmington. Yeah, we're super excited about that. Um, yeah, we just uh, broke ground about two weeks ago. We've got a, a new corporate office going up. It's around 180,000 square feet. Uh, it's called Locust Park, and it's going to be really centered around the customer experience in terms of working with our bots and our software, et cetera. So it's going to be a very, very customer-centric um, uh, journey through that building and, of course, help us from an operational uh, perspective as well. But, yeah, I can tell you the entire uh, Locust team is super excited about it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't think we can get there soon enough, but uh, it's expected we'll move in sometime early next year. Okay. That's actually pretty soon. Um, that's very exciting. And I have to ask Steve, you know, you guys have a lot of blue in your branding as well as the shirts with the Hawaiian flowers, I believe. Yeah, yeah. They're right. That's the right way to to uh describe them. What's the story? What's the origin? Oh, well, that's a great question. It, it, um, I, I'm gonna attribute that to our marketing team. Um, Karen Levitt leads our marketing team. She does a fantastic job. I mean, if you saw our booth at Promat, uh, yeah. pretty, pretty amazing um, and really welcoming for visitors and customers to get hands on with our bots. We're not the kind of company that puts a barrier fence around our bots because in reality, on the warehouse floor, associates are walking side by side with our bots uh, and working with them hand in hand. You know, I don't know the whole story behind the Hawaiian shirts uh, other than they are... Um, uh, the staple of the marketing program. Uh, and on given days at trade shows and other events, we will wear the Hawaiian shirts. But if you look closely, you'll see the Hawaiian shirts actually have locust bots on the shirts. Yeah, oh. it's kind of a hidden uh, marketing message. So Karen and the marketing team do a really fantastic job. Love that. I'll have to look closer next time because, yes, it definitely stands out. Certainly stood out at Promat. So it's super fun to see. Um, so, you know, I know you mentioned DHL. I would love to talk a little bit or really frame this conversation today with you around 3PLs, right? Because I know you certainly work with a lot yeah. of them. SVT does as well. It's a sweet spot for us. And I would love to talk through some of the challenges that 3PLs face when it comes to obviously optimizing their facilities, but um, starting to to figure out where to begin their automation journey and what workflows to optimize first. Sure. And I'd love to hear what you are experiencing in the market from these prospects and customers. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I've been in this market for quite a while. Um, and historically, 3PLs have not really invested in a lot of automation for, for many, many reasons, right? Um, but it is a hyper, hyper competitive global market right now uh, in the 3PL world for, for a number of reasons. Um, their customers, in many cases, just quite simply can't find uh, the available workforce labor uh, to ramp up quickly as they launch new businesses, maybe divest of others, et cetera. But it's a very changing, dynamic and changing world for the 3PL providers. 
But as I said, it's also super competitive. So their end customers, their tenants, if you will, are looking for innovations like robotics to help drive um, value, quality, service level agreement um, um, priorities, et cetera, as well as reduce cost. So it's again, it's all about the value proposition that a 3PL can provide to their customers and prospects. And, you know, the 3PLs are not standing still. I mean, they are all very active in many aspects of automation, not just with Locus. So it's really a changing dynamic in that 3PL world. And I don't think it's going to change. Um, you know, they're, they're a tremendous outlet for many, many customers, shippers, if you will, and manufacturers. So I think it's going to continue. But their adoption of automation to drive value, reduce cost, and improve quality and value is really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, um, you're at Ro Locus now, but you have a very extensive career in this space. Um, I won't go into every single role you've held, but I know you've also been at a big WMS, Blue Yonder, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so would love to hear a little bit about that experience and going into these three PLs. Um, I would imagine it's not just one WMS that you're connecting to. Potentially, these 3PLs have multiple systems depending on who their end customers are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I've been blessed. I've had a, a very, very uh, fortunate uh, and lucky career in many ways uh, in supply chain. I can tell you that when I got out of grad school and took my first job, um, I, so the word supply chain, the term supply chain didn't even exist, to be honest with you. Um, I was involved in a small software company doing um, basically... Uh, inventory control systems, order entry, those kinds of things. This was pre-WMS uh, and the market evolved very quickly. So the, the firm I was with was one of the pioneers from a WMS perspective. And I just kind of rode that wave over the last, you know, almost 35 years now. Um, and it's funny, um, you know, you think you turn the corner and everybody has a WMS, but the reality is they don't. And so that market is today, you know, as vibrant as it's ever been, and now with the advent of robotics, it's really, really changed uh, in, in, in many, many ways. So the collaboration between the bots and today's WMS solutions out there is really an amazing transformation of the industry as a whole. And uh, yeah, I came from a, a large software company, um, but when I saw the trend of what was happening in robotics, um, it was clear to me based on my experience that that was the next wave in terms of supply chain execution. And I just wanted to make that migration and was fortunate enough to, to land here at Locus. Yeah. So when we think about 3PLs and uh, the different, you know, they're potentially managing different host systems depending on their end customers, right? Um, so when you're having conversations and um, thinking about, you know, helping guide those prospects yeah. and customers on how do they, how do they bring in some of those, these robotics um, how does that come into play, like in terms of supporting disparate systems um, for for three PLs in particular? Yeah, it's, um, you're exactly right. Um, a lot of the three PLs historically have ended up with multiple WMS platforms, and, and most of that's through consolidation, acquisitions, mergers, et cetera, in, in the marketplace. It's natural. But you know, the three PLs that I've been involved with, you know, all have a concerted effort and a vision to. Um, minimize the number of platforms out there. And in, in many cases, they're still dealing with uh, one or two or three different WMSs for different reasons, different regions of the world, um, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it really comes back to working with them and understanding their business objectives, okay? And what they are trying to achieve working with us, integrating our bots with their WMS. Uh, and again, it goes back to, to how are they reducing cost, improving quality, service levels, et cetera, and value to their end customers. So fundamentally, it really comes down to what is the business driver? And that will then help dictate which WMS do I stay with? Do I convert to a, a more common platform, et cetera? So a lot of different factors, but fundamentally, it comes down to the business case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when it comes to um, navigating the world of AMRs, what are the questions that end users or prospects should be asking to understand what the best AMR solution is for their business? Because as you know, you go to Promat and it's just like robot everywhere, right? I would imagine as an end user, it could be quite overwhelming. 
So what questions should I be asking and how does that dictate, um, you know, what path to go down and not only, and I'd love to get into like, not only like what, um, I know you, you, you know, Locus has various solutions too. So how do we start to tease out and whittle down the available technologies? Yes. Um, you're absolutely right, Chloe. There are lots and lots of choices as we all saw at Promat. Um, uh, the number of automated robots, autonomous robots, whatever they might be, high density um, robots, et cetera. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's such a dynamic and growing environment. Lots and lots of new ideas popping up. But to go back to your question about what should end users be asking and looking for, again, I'm going to say it goes back to the business case. And primarily from a, an operational perspective, what is the use case that delivers the greatest value for you and your customers? And how can automation help improve the value that's coming out of that use case? So it might be e-com fulfillment. Um, it might be lights out, you know, ASR as pallet storage types of applications. Again, each customer in different verticals and where they sit in that vertical market are going to have different use cases. So I, I would say fundamentally, let's begin with the use case. Let's keep it simple. Let's focus on one. Let's not try to, you know, solve every problem within the four walls of distribution center or manufacturing environment, but let's focus on those strategic use cases where it gives a 3PL its unique competitive advantage and how do we improve that competitive advantage with them? Absolutely. So I think one of the, I would say a really big use case in this space is picking, right? Um, how do we optimize that workflow? And what are some of the solutions that Locus has to optimize picking? I know there's a lot of variables here, but what are some of the, um, I think, subsets of that workflow, right? Um, that help inform like what that solution looks like. Yeah, optimizing picking. So number one, picking, um, whether it's each picking, case picking, is tends to be and continues to be sort of the largest consumption of labor hours in the distribution center. And I think that's kind of how we as an organization came about. Um, and again, in terms of optimizing picking activity, one, we're trying to optimize two things. One, we're trying to optimize the, the work of the associate on the floor, as well as optimize how our bots are supporting those associates on the floor. So it really is an interesting blend of not only the robotics technology and everything physical about that bot, but also the optimization software behind the scenes. So as we get order and demands and pick requests from the WMS, we have our own Locus One platform that goes through re-optimizing um, how the bots are best gonna serve that piece of work uh, and minimizing non-productive walk time and all those other benefits that uh, the bots provide. Um, but it really is a combination of the robotics um, themselves as well as the, the optimization software in the background. And again, okay. just like uh, just like humans, our customers are asking us to address more use cases, whether that's each picking, case picking, put away replenishment, uh, pallet movements, uh, et cetera. So again, from a software perspective, we're trying to optimize um, the utilization uh, of the bots in the various uh, workflows. Absolutely. And you, you talked about the human element a little bit. I'd love to dive into that. Um, I know there's a lot of safety sort of concerns that come into play. Um, and I think even stepping back from that, I think, you know, people hear robots and they're like, they're coming for our jobs, right? Or like, it, it's it's either, it's like, oh, it's a replacement, right? And maybe that's true to some, to some degree, but it, it seems that I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, it seems like it is a combination um, where, you have AMRs coming in to do doing parts of the process sure. that maybe reduce risk from a, a safety perspective um, and use the humans where the humans can be of most value, right? Um, but would love to hear your perspective and describe sort of what you're seeing um, as you're deploying these bots in in warehouses, right? Like what is the what is the response? Um, from the, the human perspective, like on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a, a couple of things that you bring up are, are, are very, um, um, uh, you know, uh, realistic topics that, that we're work, working with, with our customers and prospects. Um, let, let's just talk about the fear of bots themselves. Right. 
Uh, I'm in an aisle and a bot goes whizzing by me. Um, the bot navigation software and all of the safety parameters and subsystems within that bot uh, make them very, very safe. Okay. Um, and part of that is, uh, goes back to introducing the whole concept of automation to an existing workforce. And we're talking about change management, training, getting some hands-on experience with the bots, overcoming that fear. And I can tell you that uh, from my experience, when um, a new prospect or a new user comes on board and they start to interact with our bots in particular, they see how easy it is to work with them. Uh, to work side by side with them. So a lot of those fears go away in a hurry. I think the other thing is that we're helping to improve the work life for those associates on the floor. So for example, I'm no longer pulling a pallet jack with multiple totes around a 250,000 square foot facility or having to wear a headset or, you know, lug an RF device along with a cart, et cetera. So, you know, through simplifying the way that our, um, our associates, our users work with our bots, it's, it's a simple low energy Bluetooth tag. And I, you know, the, the, the bots recognize who the associate is. We record their labor against that. It's a very simple and intuitive uh, iPad interface. So again, a lot of that fear goes away, but you know, the big impact, we talk a lot about the hard savings, the productivity, the ROI, which is absolutely important to justify the investment in bots. Um, but a lot of our customers come back and talk about the soft savings, the number of reduction in work-related injuries, um, decreased turnover, um, uh, again, just improving the overall work life of an associate on the floor. And, you know, a lot of our customers are using bots as a recruiting tool. So if I'm an associate and I'm out there uh, looking for a warehouse job, I go to one warehouse and I've got to pull a pallet jack or I can walk side by side with a bot, which is a more attractive alternative to me. Uh, we hear that all the time. So the soft side savings, in addition to the hard savings, are, are really, really critical. You know, the other interesting thing is uh, we see it every once in a while with startups. Uh, customer may start with, you know, say 10 bots initially, and they'll continue to pick with cards and they'll ramp up, et cetera. We see kind of a rapid adoption of the bots in those scenarios because the folks that are left pulling the cards or, or pallet jacks are questioning, hey, why am I not you know, having some fun with the bots over there. I'd rather go work with the bots. So we do see that uh, time and time again. So again, I, I think just in addition to delivering the business benefits uh, to our customers, helping them engage and retain their, their really good uh, associates uh, is fundamentally what it's all about. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And to expand upon that a little bit, could you give an example of the impact of the bots on injuries in particular? Do you have any examples you could share around that? Yeah, we've got uh, several customers that have stated publicly, you know, the the reduction in work-related injuries. Um, I won't name names without permission here, but in one case, it was a 77% reduction in uh, work-related injuries. That That's pretty dramatic. Uh, and if you think about work-related injuries, it's, it's, it's bad enough there's some sort of injury. But if you think of the total cost to deal with a work-related injury and all the different groups within your organization that have to get involved and what the cost of that injury is. Um, you know, if we can do anything to help make it a, a safer, uh, more user-friendly environment, that that's really what we're, we're striving to do with our customers. Yeah. I imagine there's serious liability there that you're yeah. helping to address. Um, sort of a little bit of a fun question here, because I don't know. Uh, how fast do these bots go? <laughs> I'm sure it can adjust, but could you speak to that? I have yeah, no our, idea. our bots travel just slightly slower than average human walk speeds, about 1.1 meters per second, okay? okay. Um, so they're very, very safe. Uh, they've got great um, uh, vision capabilities in terms of detecting obstructions or uh, people, et cetera, in their path and their ability uh, to dynamically navigate around those obstacles. Um, but, you know, the, the, the speed of the bot is, you know, we don't want people chasing bots all over the the warehouse. It's, it's got to be at a, a, a fair pace that an associate can maintain over the course of an eight or eight hour plus jo uh, job. Yep. Yep. And, you know, as you see your customers adopt um, Locus Robotics, how have you seen that shift the problem perhaps, or the, I imagine as you accelerate, you know, the picking process that might move <laughs> to some 
to some, you know, that it might create a, a backlog in, in another area of the a process. What's your, in your experience with? Yeah. And so that goes back to your question about earlier about um, the fear of bots taking my job. Um, and, and really what happens is a, a couple of things. If you think about a typical picking operation and we're able to reduce the required number uh, of associates to, you know, double or triple productivity, we're finding our customers are then reassigning those associates to different parts of the business. Okay. So for example, it's not uncommon that, um, we see, uh, p people that are normally picking move to a pack out operation, right? Because of the increase in velocity and productivity, et cetera. So our customers are, are working with us, uh, and with their associates, you know, in a smart way. We're also seeing in the market where a lot of uh, practitioners are dealing with a heavy percentage of temporary labor. And so that's a really difficult thing to work through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so many customers are working with two or three different temp agencies in a given building just to get the bodies in the building to do the work. And so helping our customers kind of avoid that uh, operating mode, we can deploy bots that show up every day. They're smiling. They're happy to go to work. Um, it can reduce that, redu that, that dependence on temp labor. Um, that's one side of it. I think the other side of it is as the bots are deployed and we're gathering data and working with our customers, analyzing the performance of not only the facility, but of the bots themselves, it's a tremendous opportunity to drive continuous improvement. So all of the data and dashboards, et cetera, reporting that we do, uh, we actually build in continuous improvement service hours into our robots as a service contracts with our customers. So our continuous improvement team will sit with the customer's team on a periodic basis, review the performance of the system, look at the layout of the building, how's the business changing, make those adjustments, and again, continue to, to strive to uh, reduce cost, improve productivity uh, from a continuous improvement perspective. That's a huge downstream benefit of deploying the bots. Yep. And you bring up robots as a service. Could you uh, break that down a little bit for people that might be less familiar with that model? Because um, it's not brand new, but it's, it hasn't been around forever. Yeah, I, um, Locus was really one of the pioneers in terms of going to market robots as a service. So it really is a, uh, it's essentially a subscription. So our customers are subscribing to use our bots for a period of time, uh, typically multiple years. Uh, but, you know, the benefit is there's no large capital expense outlay up front. It makes the approval process um, much easier. It's really, you know, the cost of the bots are really an offset to the some of the labor that gets reallocated within a building. Um, so, again, the, the big advantage is is no CapEx up front, um, easier uh, approvals, uh, and it fits within budgeting uh, much easier than, than, again, absorbing this huge CapEx. Uh, up front and having to buy the bots. So in our robots as a service, we bundle not only the bots, but the software and dashboards and service and maintenance and support. So it's an all-inclusive uh, fee on a monthly basis for the bots. In addition, um, what we can do is we can scale up and down based on the customer's business cycles. So let's say that you're an apparel manufacturer, uh, maybe uh, children's clothing. Yep. So back to school would be a peak season for you, as well as the traditional holiday Black Friday season. We can, because of our robots as a service, um, right into the agreement for those peak periods, we will ship the customer peak bots. Customers will use those bots during peak season. And at the end of peak season, they return them to us and they only pay for those bots during peak season. So it's extremely financially um, acceptable and, and uh, uh, alternative versus having to buy a, ba a bunch of extra bots and have them sit around the warehouse and off-peak. So again, very flexible and, and customers absolutely love it. So you'll literally at the end of a peak season, go and, and pick up X amount of bots, bring them back to your facility um, and redeploy where they're needed. That's correct. Absolutely correct. What we, what we also find is that customers uh, through peak season start to take a look at overall demand. Is my demand increasing or decreasing? In most cases, it's increasing. And so they may actually take some of those peak bots and add them to the fleet on a, on a permanent basis and return, you know, the remainder of the peak bots to us. So a lot of flexibility for our, for our customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, flexibility is key. <laughs> Name of the game. Uh, I think in this industry and particularly for three PLs, cause there's so many variables that they're, they're, they're navigating. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about what, you know, it would have been the weeds here, but what makes 
a customer a really good fit for for Locus in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, we do a lot of homework up front, you know, working with our partners and prospects um, in identifying, um, I'll go back to the term use case. You know, what are the data volumes? What are the order profiles look like? What's the labor situation? What's the physical layout of the facility? Does the facility, um, is it readily acceptable in terms of being able to deploy bots or are there changes that have to be made? We're lucky that we're able to deploy our bots in most existing warehouse facilities with very uh, few, if any, changes to the physical environment. So there are a lot of factors. Again, order volume uh, could be on the picking side, could be on the replenishment side, labor availability, labor costs, labor turnover. Uh, and again, a lot of the physical aspects of the distribution center, where and how will the bots be used? What are the travel paths? Where are induct points, drop off? Where are the pack stations? All of those things go into kind of the mix of data that we gather. We run that through our models and we're able to then to begin to work with our partners and customers and say, given this environment, we think IOWIS are adequate. You've got enough free space uh, for charging units, et cetera. Um, or if we face a, a situation where there are some constraints, maybe the order volume is not really what the customer thought it was um, and sure. can't really substantiate um, the use of bots. There, there, there's all kinds of factors that come into play, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about integration, right? Because I think, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but there's so much cool tech out there, yeah. right? That's like, how do we get it to all work together? Because um, the reality is, people are likely, you know, especially I would say 3PLs, they're going to have different use cases for different customers sure. and different technical requirements when it comes to automation and be dealing with multiple systems. So, how has your experience been um, as, or what have you witnessed as customers, you know, select, you know, hey, we want, you know, X amount of bots. And even just from your experience in this industry too, um, that next step with integration, I know we do a lot with you on that front, but would just, before we even get into that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, how your prospects navigate that that piece of the puzzle, sure. right? Like every bought in, but then what does that look like to actually deploy and integrate into existing systems? Yeah, I mean, integration, you know, as you're aware in the market historically has been, you know, a tough nut to crack. Um, but, you know, with the, the evolution of bots, uh, the maturing of WMS systems out there, I mean, just decades and decades of experience in WMS implementation out there, you know, companies like SVT have taken advantage of their skills and experience in the marketplace and say, hey, wait a minute, there's a better way to do a better, easier, cheaper, faster way to do integration. Um, and the SVT softbots are a good example of that. So, you know, we can go to market um, together and present a case to a customer and help them overcome the cost and hurdles typically associated with integration. So in general, integrations have gotten easier. I think it's going to continue to get easier. Um, particularly on one-to-one -one, uh, with bots, where it gets start to get a little complex, and we're starting to see this now, is where multiple automation subsystems exist in a single facility. That becomes a real challenge from an integration perspective, and it always will be. But again, I think that the approach that uh, your organization and others are taking are helping to really overcome um, the fear and cost and risk associated with traditional old-school integration. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I think that, I don't know I, the stats off the top of my head, but I think if you look at the projected adoption of automation in this industry, and then you look at the the existing skill set from like a developer, like these specialized developers and integrators sure. um, to support that, like the numbers don't quite work, right? The demand is simply too high um, to continue doing it as we're doing it today. So, um, yeah, I, to your point, I do think there's more focus. Obviously that's why SVT exists, um, on solving that barrier to automation, yeah. um, and getting all this cool tech, you know, up and running and, and delivering value. Right. Yeah. But, um, and I think it's related, you know, if you look at the industry and the, you know, the emergence of all these robotic solutions that are coming up of all shapes and flavors, um, 
there's another angle to this whole bot and integration and systems, et cetera. And that goes back to what is our basic design philosophy for a facility that is going to deploy bots? This is really very new. If you think about it, you know, uh, Locus as an organization, for example, we're seven years old, I believe. Um, that's a very short window particularly in an industry where distribution centers have always sort of been designed the way we always do them. Well, now with the advent of all these different bots, it changes the layout, it changes the material flow. Um, it's a very interesting thing to see in the marketplace in terms of those traditional systems integrators, design consultants, et cetera, and how they are designing buildings today versus how they did that 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's really an amazing uh, transformation on that side of the business. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely resonates with what we're hearing as well. Um, and even, who was it? I had someone on the podcast a couple months ago, even just talking about uh, in this sort of post-COVID world where um, like real estate has just simply changed drastically in the past few years, um, how spaces are being used, what spaces are more empty than ever, like office spaces, and what spaces are in more demand, right, as facilities yeah. need to um, and the supply chain specifically uh, is, I don't want to say struggling, but like there's a lot of demand there, right? Oh, tremendous demand. Uh, you know, um, I, I live here in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I just witnessed here in the last couple of months, uh, one of the major malls in the area was completely torn down. You know, the, the, the way that we are buying today, it's, it's, it's a generational, it's a cultural shift in the marketplace. So there's just tons of opportunity related to real estate, size of locations, micro fulfillment centers, all of this great stuff is happening. Um, and it's just, it's just the way that the world is changing. Uh, you know, we're, I don't really believe we're going to see traditional retail stores and buying habits um, the, the way that, uh, you know, that you and I grew up, uh, you know, uh, doing. I, I've got three little grandsons and I guarantee, you know, they really don't even know what the mall is. I mean, they know the they know the Amazon Prime trucks and FedEx and UPS trucks. So it's a completely different paradigm and it's exciting. Uh, and, and to your point, all of these, this available real estate, uh, it, it, somebody's going to come up with a golden idea, yeah, uh, as bots develop, et cetera. So just tremendous opportunity yeah. across across the entire industry. It is. It is wild. And I, I you know, personally, I, I'm definitely on board with shopping online most of the time, but uh, the problem is returns, which I know are oh. for so many people in the industry, like such a headache, right? It adds cost. Um, you know, there's just so many issues, but I struggle. I can't make it to ship it. I need, I need someone to come along and just return things for me. That's my, yeah, but that's, that's, you know, that's a great example of how this whole, you know, world has changed. I mean, you know, um, I, I won't quote the stats off the top of my head, uh, but we're working with one partner that um, deals with uh, returns processing from a software capability. That market is absolutely huge on a global basis. Yep. The volume of returns, the work associated with it. So are bots replacing workers uh, or are we taking more associates uh, from a picking area, with the, which was optimized by bots, and we can now redirect them to better management of returns processing, et cetera? That's all sort of in the mix right now. Uh, and where it shakes out, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, returns, as you mentioned, is a tremendous burden on the industry. Wild. I remember it was quite a few years ago now, um, there was a startup and their, their whole value prop is we will literally like go to your office or your home and pick up the package and like wrap it up and send it back. Like we will handle your return. I don't know if they're still around today. I don't think they are. But I, it was worth the five dollars for me, just because on the consumer side, it, I don't sure. know, maybe it's just it's a struggle. But then, yeah, on the other side, I cannot imagine um, the challenge and and also the opportunity that's there. Yeah, but that so, goes yeah. back to you know the use case and the value prop, um, and whether, um, for example, a retailer is managing their own returns or you know they're working with a three PL uh, and returns processing. Again, it goes back to the use case. How can we optimize that, increase value, reduce cost, improve quality? It, it, it's a major challenge, absolutely major challenge. And it's global in nature. Absolutely. And I think in that case, I, I mean, it's a little bit of a tangent, but like that, uh, I think that requires a much tighter collaboration between those, that operations team 
and even the digital side, right? The marketing side. How can we better educate the customer at the front end to reduce um, returns, right? Yeah, exactly. And the labor required there. Well, and I mean, if you're a retailer running a, your own distribution center, you know, historically you've had X number of returns. Well, that has grown exponentially through e comm et cetera. It goes back to a little bit of the design philosophy. How and where am I going to manage all of this return material in a building that wasn't designed to handle that? Um, it presents challenges across the board for everybody. But, you know, it's a fascinating time and exciting time. And, you know, good things are going to come out of it. Absolutely. And finally, I just wanted to, you know, we have the Locus Origin Picking Connector. We do have, we can't go into details around the customers, but we do have some customers that are leveraging that to connect to um, Locus Box and their host systems. Um, I would love to hear sort of what that partnership, that, 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 that certified connector really um, that now that enables that kind of plug and play integration between your your robots and customers host system what that's kind of unlocked for your customers and prospects as well yeah i think a couple of things there uh chloe one is just the the ease at which integration can be done you know in terms of working with the svt soft bots for example you know linking our bots to some third-party wms and not only is it the upfront development cost, um, but these are proven models. And so it minimizes a bit of the testing uh, because, you know, we have enough proof points out there where we're minimizing risks associated with integration. I think the other thing is um, uh, support and maintenance and supporting upgrades going forward. So that historically has been a, a, a big challenge. But, you know, if you're in an environment with the Locus uh, bots and, uh, you know, third-party WMS, uh, the Locust bot on uh, integrating with the WMS is maintaining um, support of the various versions and upgrades there, as well as on the Locust side. So there's some really tremendous, um, tremendous savings and, and um, uh, uh, opportunities uh, using, you know, connectors like the soft bots from SVT. Yeah, right. Because it doesn't, as you guys update your API, for example, we're not asking you to change anything. We're not asking the WMS to change anything. Correct. We kind of manage that change without an additional burden or change order from you know that we that would be put on the customer yeah, so absolutely. yeah that's a big one i have to ask about ai it is you know we hear we hear those two letters a lot lately yeah. um i hear i feel like it was crypto and like web3 and now ai i mean i know it's not new but we're hearing it um so much lately and I would love to hear how you see that playing into the next sort of phase of robotics and what you're doing and envisioning over at Locus as well as it pertains to AI. Yeah, you're right. Um, in many ways, AI has become a part of uh, our everyday business jargon, um, you know, with the advent of the likes of ChatGTP, et cetera. Um, again, I think it's, it's, it's indicative of how, you know, the next frontier we generate so much data with all these systems, right? We can't possibly, as humans, you know, dream up enough reports or charts or graphs, et cetera, whatever it might be. Um, but AI is very much an integral and important component of where we see our solutions going. So we have adopted and begun to integrate AI and machine learning into our applications with our data science team, much like many other um, customers, prospects, partners, et cetera. Um, it clearly is the next frontier from a software perspective. And when you look at the dollars that are being invested in AI and generative AI, the numbers are absolutely staggering. Um, and I don't think we would see that level of investment from developers, software companies, um, venture capitalists, et cetera, if they didn't really believe that there's some downstream value that we're going to see from AI. I think AI is really, really going to change the way systems are deployed and how that supports continuous improvement, et cetera. Uh, it's terribly fascinating and it's a very important and strategic part uh, of our locus um, um, strategy going forward. Yeah, that's exciting. And I like the term terribly fascinating. <laughs> I think that encapsulated, there's so much cool opportunity, but also responsibility there. So yeah, exactly. Uh, to see exactly. It's out. But again, just one of those frontiers that it's there. Um, we're not, we're not sure where it's all going to go, but 
uh, again, you got to be part of that uh, and participating and learning, uh, or you're going to get left behind, to be honest. Absolutely. All right. So just to wrap it up, Steve, if you could give a little piece of advice to some folks out there starting on their journey, no, no bots in their warehouse, what would be something you would, you would want to leave them with? Boy, uh, that's a a very, very interesting question. You know, again, I I would say, um, if, if you're, um, a, a company that's starting to look at robots as a possible addition, you know, to your facilities and your systems, et cetera. Again, I would go back to let's identify what are the use cases, the workflows, the pieces of your business that are changing dramatically, that are maybe having some, causing some pain points, those kinds of things. Let's focus on one or two use cases, prove them out, and then look at, you know, broader applications of bots. Um, But, you know, the good news is that even with, you know, the advent of so many robotic solutions out there, uh, we, for example, have more than 100 customers, more than 250 uh, facilities worldwide de- deployed using our bots. So there are plenty, plenty of proof points out there. I would encourage prospects, customers, work with the vendors, work with providers like Locus. Go visit a few sites. Go see it and learn. Put your hands on. Come to our demo center. Um, don't be afraid of making the change. Uh, there, there are plenty of others along that path with you. Uh, but again, I would say, again, the use case, the business case, and then let's go visit some sites. Let's overcome fears, answer questions. Um, and that would, you know, you know, that would really help expedite kind of solution uh, definition and uh, uh, decisions within an organization. Great advice. Go see yeah, it. I mean, we're, here, we're here to help the customers. So yeah. it's all, that's what it's all about. I love that. Um, and you guys do such a great job at trade shows, but definitely echo that. Just being able to get into a facility and, and see it in action, take the the scariness out yeah. of it um, and see how humans are actually um, working alongside. That's great. I really appreciate your time, Steve, and hope to see you back here at an event in the very near future. All right, great. Chloe, it was wonderful to spend uh, some time this morning with you. I enjoyed it very much and look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Cheers.